Over the years, I've done a lot of videos about fakes in the antique market, especially the Chinese antique market, because it's such an enormous industry. Uh, there's an interesting statistic that came out um, a, a, a while ago, and they said that the, the, the FBI and Interpol said the, the three largest criminal enterprises in the world, as far as uh, uh, dishonest, deception, uh, illegal uses of money and all that, financial crimes, in other words, the number one financial crimes, are in this order, and it's rather astounding, I illegal weapons transactions around the world, uh, illegal drug transactions around the world, and the art market. The art market is a multi-billion dollar market and it has billions of dollars of fraud in it every single year um, and, and, and due to different things, including uh, outright thefts, of course, and uh, fraud, fraudulent artworks, fakes, reproductions, copies that are misrepresented and so forth. And it is a very, very big problem. So to protect yourself, you have to understand the auction market as it stands today. You, you have to understand what auctioneers can do with little chance of any legal repercussions and what you cannot do if you get taken. Keep that in mind. If you get taken, there's people often think, "Well, I can, I can, I can, I can I'll, I'll, I'll make them take it back." And I'll, no, you can't. All right, you really, really cannot. And this, what, what you can't do, might surprise you. But always keep in mind, there is virtually no legal enforcement in most countries, including the U.S., against sellers of fakes of art in the Chinese art world. They simply don't care. All right, they really, really don't care. So what, how, how do folks get taken? Well, the, the most obvious answer is, is greed. And I'm not saying it in a, in a, human nature is everybody wants to make a buck. All right, everybody likes to make some money and, and making easy money is of course the, the great lure of, uh, uh, you know, W.C. Field said you, you, you can't take an honest man. And you have people who, who are, are not honest with themselves about what they really know about Chinese art and antiques. They look at pictures, they've been interested maybe for a short time, you know, three or four years or something. And um, they start looking online and they find great rarities under every rock they look under. And they think, wow, this is amazing. This isn't that hard to do. Uh, it, it's sort of like it's sort of like you know trying to find a gold bar that's for sale for fifty bucks. You're not going to find it, all right. But that's sort of the victim mindset, and uh, as far as the auctioneers uh, are concerned, and it's how they take your money by the barrel full, twenty four hours a day, three hundred sixty five days a year, in all places all over the world. Um, um, they know what you want. The auction houses know what you want and are more than happy to deceive you with a superb copy made specifically for that very purpose. All right. And uh, one of the things I wanted to share was that on, on the, on the bitamount.com site that we run, we have an area known as the Global Member Pages, and it's, it's a subscription section. And on it, we provide a, a regularly updated uh, report card on auction houses. And uh, it's, a, it's a database list. There's about 420 auctioneers on there uh, right now. They are uh, all over the world. Um, and uh, we look at them uh, regularly. We update this card all the time. And I want to sh show you how, how bad it really is. This is the report card. And if you use the Global Pages, you're very familiar with it because it gets a lot of access. People check this thing all the time. And uh, the reason we put it there was that if you come across auction houses that get an F, don't do business with them. Avoid them. Stay away from them. All right. They are dishonest. All right, and this is the this is the uh, auctioneers that get all Fs, and uh, there are 75 auction houses on a page. All right, and it's fairly continuous. Here's the next page again, more all Fs, and you notice we put avoid always and that kind of thing next to it. If you just see it, if you see an F, don't even consider buying from them. Um, and then it goes from Fs to D and F. All right, and Ds are guys that sell occasional real things, but they but they knowingly also sell fakes and copies. All right, uh, and, but lean more towards fakes than, than, than real things. Those are all the Ds. Then you get to the Cs. Again, they sell fakes and copies, but it's sort of an even balance, uh, perhaps. Uh, or they just uh, misrepresent things, or they don't provide accurate or, or datable information all the time. Sometimes they get real things, sometimes they don't. Um, it doesn't mean that they're de necessarily dishonest. It just means that they are uh, maybe in over their depth, or they prefer to keep things vague in their descriptions uh, because they want to get as much money as they can. All right, and and and, and being vague or uh, omitting things um, is is a it can, for many of them is just an excuse not to be held responsible, and those are the C's. But when you get to the A's, how many auction houses get an A? 
All right. And out of all out of all of those, out of the 420, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine auction houses that we give A or A plus ratings to. Okay. That's it. That's it out of 420. And um, uh, if, if, if you have if you know of an auction house that's particularly great, let me know. All right. And what to look for if, in, in these auctions. Um, uh, when you when you come across an auction, um, this is the kind of thing you see. I just I went to live auction news and typed in Chinlung vase, and every vase that returned on this on this query is a copy, every single one of them, and uh, they're sold by a variety of auction houses. There are uh, 611 um, auction results just for Chinlung vase, not for Chinlung. If you type in Chinlung, that number is going to go up quite a bit. All right, and um, uh, jumps up to 13,33, so it goes up to you know 200, 100%. All right, and again, it's all fakes and copies. Okay, from what I'm seeing. All right, and this is what you see when you look at uh, 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 some of these auction houses. Go to their auction page, and this will tell you everything you need to know. Uh, this is the Quan Rung Gallery. Okay, they sell copies. They're in Chatham, New Jersey, and uh, this is their upcoming sale. Go to the completed sales and take a look. What do you see? You see auction after auction of beautiful looking, colorful, rare looking things. And they're all copies from what I can tell. All right. I've never seen I've never seen Quan Rong sell anything that's authentic. Maybe they have in the past. I don't know, but I've never seen it. All right. And, and this is this is how many auctions they've done. And an auction house that pulls in this kind of info, this much material, if it were authentic, would be the, the, the most successful Asian art auction house in the world, um, uh, period. End of discussion, all right? Um, this is Eden Auction House. You're going to notice some real similar looking pictures. Um, and lately, what Eden has been doing, they've been sprinkling in actual American and European antiques into their sales of Chinese antiques to sort of give it a, a, a flavor of authenticity. But when you look back at their previous sales, uh, they have auctions with manufactured provenances, names of, 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 of you know supposedly famous collectors that nobody's ever heard of, um, with major, major things. None of the things sell for any real money. All right, and then you have this. This is Empire. They're located in Massachusetts. They do only online sales. I believe they used to be in New York and they moved. Uh, and uh, they, they do online sales. And uh, in the state of Massachusetts, I can tell you that there's absolutely nothing that the auctioneer board here can do about it. Uh, in most states, they can't if the sales are all online. If there's no physical person in the room, the auction uh, licensing committees in most states have no authority over those auctions because there, there's no person present buying an object in the room. All right, it's all done online. And this is Latere Auctions. Again, same sort of stuff. Uh, this is a, a company that uh, sort of reinvented itself from what I've been told that it used to be Altair Auctions and they got in a lot of trouble a few years ago and uh, they had to change the name, it got so bad. But that is sort of uh, what you wanna look for. If you see a long history of numerous um, uh, auctions of great rarities and they're not one of the major auction houses, you can be pretty well assured that everything they're selling is a fake. All right, that's sort of how it works. All right, and, and, and that's something that you, you have to uh, 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 know. All right, so let's set, set the stage a little bit and who the players are, okay? Who are the buyers? Who, who, uh, how do the auctioneers get away with it? And, and so forth. In general, Asian art buyers fall into three loose categories. Okay, you have people who are pure collectors that are fascinated with material culture. They're fascinated with Chinese uh, history, Asian art in general, the, you know, uh, uh, the art world. They're true enthusiasts. Okay, I call them the, the real collectors, true collectors. And then you have folks that want to buy and sell a little bit. Maybe maybe they're uh, 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 they want to deal uh, uh, sell a little bit on the side, but the, mainly they're interested in collecting, uh, and they'll buy a lot with five or six things in it or ten things in it. They'll pull out the one or two things they want to keep, and then they'll resell the rest. And those are sort of the in betweeners. And then you have people who are just uh, 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 pure dealers. They're only buying to to make money. That's the only reason. They're not really that much in love with the stuff. They just want to buy it to make a profit off of it. And then you have sort of blends of all of the above mixed into it. 
All right, and that and that's 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 this that's the stage that uh, uh, most buyers fit into. Those are the areas they fit into. Okay, and a practical approach to, to learning about Asian art in general, um, and, and if you haven't done this, you, you, you you're going to have trouble. Um, requires years of dedicated study and, and a fascination with material culture, interest in Chinese history, interest in Japanese, whatever it is, but, but their history, how their art came about. Uh, China history, uh, art history is very, very long. It goes back thousands of years. And it is interesting to learn how the piece, pieces were first made, how the first bronzes were done, why they were done, the first bits of pottery, um, carvings, uh, 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 you know, early writing, all that. It's absolutely fascinating. And how it evolved over time through the various dynasties and periods of Chinese history. It's fascinating to watch the evolution. All right. That, that, is, that is the way you go about it. All right. And it requires a lot of work. It requires years and years and years of study. It requires the purchase uh, and accumulation of a, of a high quality, uh, significant library of reference material. Many, many books. OK, I, I, after 40 years um, in my own uh, library, I probably have 2,500 books. All right. And, and many of them are very, very specialized books on just uh, you know, n narrow areas of art, very, very, you know, paintings of a certain period, uh, 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 bowls and ceramics made at a certain kiln from a certain period, and that kind of thing. Those are the kind of books that you have to learn from, you have to study them. And uh, you want to join societies, you want to join uh, museums in your area and, and, and uh, show an interest there, let them know what you what your what your in, what interests you, maybe they have a hands on they have hands on days where you can go in with a curator and physically look at objects, they have symposiums and all that. And those are the kind of things that you want to do to really learn and it takes time. It's a long journey. But it's worth it and it's fun all the way through. Okay. Regrettably, human nature being what it is, it's almost impossible to do all of this without the financial temptation to try and make some money um, by finding a great rarity uh, online. Online just makes it way too easy, also. And, uh, 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 and then gives you sort of the, you know, the fun of selling something that you bought very, very inexpensively for a large profit to one of the major dealers or through a reliable auction house, uh, like one of the, the nine that I showed you at the beginning. They'll all do a good job for you um, and uh, uh, you'll be rewarded for it, okay? But it's sort of like wanting to buy a winning lottery ticket. Everybody would like to. If, so, if somebody said to you, um, oh, you know, this, this, this is the place where they sell winning lottery tickets, one in, you know, one in five tickets they sell every day is a winner, you'd go in there and buy five or ten tickets, okay? The fact is that such places don't exist, and the fact is, is that auction houses like that do not exist either. They don't exist. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a unicorn. You're chasing a unicorn. All right. And the chances of, of buying a, a, a piece of porcelain or a piece of jade or a scroll or anything like that, 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 you know, for, for a couple of thousand dollars, it may be worth a half a million or millions, um, is pretty close to zero. It's about the same, about the same odds as winning a, you know, a, a, a 30 or $40 million lottery ticket. That's how rare it is. The problem is that every once in a while, there is a case where this kind of thing happens and it gets, the, it gets magnified in the media so often that it seems like it's a common occurrence. Um, one of the one of the one of the cases uh, uh, recently was uh, a few years ago was that bowl that was bought in Long Island at a, at a yard sale, and the people uh, didn't know anything about it. They had it in their house for a while, and then finally they decided just on a whim to show it to somebody from Sotheby's, and lo and behold, it was an enormous rarity, and they sold it for two and a half million dollars. All right, and that sent people flooding into the market, uh, uh, tr trying to uh, find a bowls that looked like that. These Sung white. Uh, 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 bowls uh, that sold, um, and there are lots of copies around, and they got gobbled up like crazy. People people bought them, and it, the, that was it. And everybody was out a lot of money. And this is the kind of thing that happens, all right. And if you're an, whether you're a novice dealer or a novice collector, and you're only a bit fairly knowledgeable, the chances of finding that great bargain price is uh, item is is not like I said, not much different than winning a lottery ticket. Um, and if you're a collector, of course, you, you also want to find a great rarity and maybe you have a modest budget and you want to find it at a bargain price. And this is a dangerous inclination because you, you, people don't realize that it doesn't happen that often, often enough that it could actually be gone out and done on one, one in a million. It happens. That's sort of the, the, the rule. OK, bargain hunting can be fun, but it can also be very, very risky. 
And the less you know, the less likely you are to be successful. You're ex if you're extremely competent um, and very experienced, then yeah, you can look around and you, you might find something. And uh, it, from my own experience, even at times when I've found a, a rarity, sort of a one-off situation in an oddball auction somewhere, um, by the time the auction shows up, it's been discovered, it's been found. Um, there are collectors in China and Hong Kong and Shanghai and here in America that have curatorial staffs, pe serious collectors, wealthy collectors, have teams of people who spend their day browsing the Internet. They go through the Internet, they go through auctions, they go through everything, and, and they're, they're trying to find things that uh, haven't been maybe picked up by one of the big auction houses. And uh, that is what they do. So even in the rare event that a great piece turns up in a small sale, or maybe a, a, a great piece, typically more the most common scenario is a great piece turns up in a, in a, in a medium-sized auction house and they woefully underestimate it. And that gets the, the interest of, of, of the potential buyers uh, that are experienced and they, they get involved with it. Uh, there was a case of a, a plate that turned up in an auction in Canada a few years ago. It was a well-regarded auction house and the place ended up, plate ended up selling you know, for, for a couple of million dollars. All right. But it got discovered. It got discovered by a lot of people. And it was it was an out of the way auction that you wouldn't think anybody would even be aware of. It got found. All right. An old dealer friend of mine said to me once, he said, after after being in the business for 10 years, I realized I knew half then of what I thought I knew after being in the business for five years. And he said, and here I am almost five decades later, still learning. All right. And that is the truth. OK, so be honest about how much you really know. When examining an object in person, you have to always remind yourself how many hundreds or thousands of this particular type have you held, dealt with previously that you knew were authentic? How many real pieces have you physically examined? And if you don't, if you can't say a lot of them, um, you're you could get yourself into trouble. All right. When looking at pictures without an experience, without a lot of experience, how could you possibly decide based on a photograph on the internet? Um, the truth is you can't. That, that's really what it is. All right. So let's talk about the elephant in the room a little bit here. The dishonest auctioneer and their mindset and what they're what they are relying on because they rely on certain things. All right. And, um, and this is how they do what they do and how they get away with it year after year. The first thing that you have to know when you see any of those auction houses other than the top eight or nine that I mentioned, um, the ones that sell fakes, the, the people that get F's and D's, all right, um, uh, they know something that's, that's uh, very important. They are keenly aware that nearly 100% of their buyers are inexperienced buyers that have been buying for just a few years, maybe buying for five years or six years or eight years or less. Very inexperienced, very green behind the ears, all right? And th they can play into that. All right, and offer up copies of hundred thousand half, you know, one million dollar objects, and sell them for ten cents on the dollar. And and the buyers not understanding the objects and not understanding the auction market, and not understanding um, the, the the dangers of the auction market, uh, think they got a great buy if they buy something for five or six cents on what they think is the dollar. They'll look at the item, you know, on that auction, then they'll go over to Sotheby's and say, "Oh my God, one just like it sold for six million dollars," and bang suddenly they spend twenty or thirty thousand dollars to buy the one that's at this other auction because they think it's real it's not going to be real it's a fake all right and the, and they and these auction houses rely on on this sort of uh, the, the greed of the inexperienced uh, seller or the naivete of the inexperienced seller and and, and this this is this is uh, is 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 a, is a uh, the, the constant that comes up all the time all right um, inexperienced collectors have never worked with um, a major dealer, a reliable dealer that could teach them the ins and outs that, you know, you, you buy things from them. They explain the history of the piece. They talk about how to, you know, how you can tell it's authentic, the, uh, the way it's decorated, all of the little things that add up to knowledge that allows you to go out into the world and, and, and take, and take with you to learn. All right. Um, uh, short of that and short of loads of experience, you're, you're just setting yourself up for a problem. All right. Um, um, if a collector, if, like I said before, haven't handled dozens of authentic rarities over the years and talked to people and learned, um, um, how, how can they tell a fake from, a, from, a, from an authentic example? The ample answer is they simply can't. 
and the auctioneer knows it. The auctioneer knows this, all right? When it comes to valuable object, keep in mind that almost any detail thought to be an indication of authenticity can be put there by a good forger. And most of them, most of the forgers know more about authenticity and what the characteristics are to look for than a lot of museum curators and a lot of major auction house experts, all right? Because these guys have gotten things on occasion, not often, very rare, but on occasion, they've ended up on the covers of, of auction house catalogs. Um, um, there have been a number that was sort of embarrassing because they put them on the on the cover and they had to withdraw the cover lot because it was proven to be a fake uh, a, a day or two before the auction, all right? The forgers are incredibly knowledgeable. Don't think they aren't. They truly are. They, they, many of them are multi-generational businesses. They study and they study how things were made in the years gone by. They have access to books on kilns and chemistry and all this stuff that is required to make a good copy. All right. And um, this is something that uh, the, the, the sellers of uh, Chinese art fakes um, um, uh, no, this is what they do. All right, and they don't have to. They don't have to necessarily. Any of the auction houses that sell stuff, they they don't know much about Chinese art. But they they hire people and they they buy from people who are very knowledgeable and they know um, what will deceive the folks most easily. What what is the, what are the what are the objects out of the that are the most likely to deceive people and be successful in in, in causing a transaction? All right. And uh, uh, the idea that uh, I had, I've had people say to me, well, I found this auction and the auctioneer doesn't know what he has. N never think or assume for a minute that a multi-thousand or even million dollar item is going to turn up at one of these auctions. Never think that's much of a likelihood at all, especially with the auctioneer having no idea what it is. All right. If an auction, most auctioneers, if they have something really great, they know it's pretty great. They know it's great. All right, and never think that you can spot uh, items, um, uh, authentic items from fakes because you have some sort of gift at sensing what an antique is. All right, you don't. You, you, it, it, people like that, I've seen them lose fortunes because they got lucky once, uh, and not majorly lucky. Maybe they bought something for a hundred dollars that they sold for eight hundred, and they went, "Wow, boy, that's a great way. That's a quick seven hundred bucks. I'm really good at this." And suddenly they're out over their skis and they're writing big checks and they're buying absolute crap trying to recreate um, the, their, that initial experience, but in the multiples, in multiples. All right. And this is this is uh, the, how it is. Um, you know, uh, these occurrences happen once in a while, but but the, the chances of finding it are very, very rare. All right. The other thing that auction houses will do too is that they'll have a legitimate. You'll have a. You'll have an. Uh, you'll have an auction with a few legitimate things in it. They'll sprinkle in some Canton, some rose medallions, some Fitzhugh, some Nanking, common export wares that are easily identified from photographs as authentic, and they'll sprinkle those into a sale full of fakes. And many many buyers will will look through it and they'll say, "Wow, he's described those all perfectly. So so obviously, you know, he knows his stuff, and the rest of the sale must be fine." All right. And it's all a trap. It's all a trap. And, 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 and I mean, you could learn to identify most common export wares in an afternoon with a good teacher. Sit down with, with, with 20 or 30 examples and go through them. And in four or five hours, you can learn enough to, to pick up uh, what's an authentic piece of Canton uh, or, or authentic piece of rose medallion or rose mandarin or something uh, pretty quickly. It doesn't take long. There are a few things you need to learn to know, and that's about it. It isn't a difficult thing. All right. And lastly, the auction houses rely on the big thing. And the big thing is, is that most buyers of fakes, once they understand they've been taken, won't do anything about it. They just won't. It, uh, I've seen it time and time again. They may make a phone call or two to see if the auction house will take it back, um, or maybe they'll send a letter, uh, you know, demanding um, some sort of uh, um, help, or they'll have a lawyer send a letter and um, or, or contact the credit card company. 
and um, all that, and uh, it'll go nowhere. It goes nowhere. Um, and, and, and they just sort of lick their wounds and go back to where they are, especially if they're buyers in China. Buyers in China, um, if they buy a fake from an American gallery, um, they're not going to do anything about it. They just may not buy from them again, but there are an awful lot of people to take their place. So that's the way it is. And then other people, they buy a fake, then they're told by numerous people that it's a fake, and they're just in denial because they spent some serious, they maybe they sent 10 or 20 or 30, 40 thousand dollars, and they're just not mentally willing to accept the fact that they've been taken. All right, because it's upsetting and it causes people, brings people to question their own judgment and intellect and uh, they take it personally and that's it. So uh, the auction houses, in short, rely on embarrassment and denial um, that things won't go any further. OK, so there's there's a there's there's a, 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 a few things that you um, you can do uh, uh, to uh, pr protect yourself. Um, first thing is, you know, you, you look for the alarm bells, and the alarm bells are those auction houses that I just showed you. If you scroll down and take a look at their history of auctions, do they seem to have an endless supply of fantastic rarities that sell for bargain basement prices? If so, you don't have to look any further. Just move on. That's it. You don't don't even consider it. Don't browse it. Don't say, well, maybe something good slipped in. No, no. They, they, their business is selling copies. Their business is not selling authentic stuff. If they got something that was authentic, they're going to send it to New York to send it. They're not going to put it in one of their sales. All right. So uh, the, the the next question you have to also ask yourself when you look at the price results of some of these companies. Think about this for a minute. How is it an auction house can routinely sell great rarities? generally at a fraction of their real values if they were authentic without the word getting out to major collectors who know their stuff. This would cause prices to soar by hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars. How, how is it that these, these auctions are, are, are never covered by Arts of Asia magazine or orientations or any of the trade papers? Um, they don't cover them because they know they sell fakes. But you have to realize that, that if, it, if, if there was an auction house in the United States or in Europe that turned up fantastic rarities and imperial this and imperial that's on a regular basis and they were selling for 10 cents on the dollar, those prices would, would, would very rapidly rise uh, because the, the real collectors, the knowledgeable collectors, the major dealers would be there pushing prices. They'd be in there buying inventory, all right, because they're happy to buy something for, you know, a million dollars they can sell for a million three. All right. They're not looking to buy. I mean, they, they would, but, but they're, they're not expecting to buy something that's worth a million three for, for $10,000. They know better. They know better. So as a result, you look through these auctions, the prices never go up. And the reason is, is that the only bidders are the neophytes, are the beginners, are the people that have been at it for less than 10 years, that have been at it for five years, that have owned a few books, have looked at a few Sotheby's catalogs, and that's the end of it. All right. That they just keep thinking, well, this will this will be my you know my chance. No, you don't have a chance. If the stuff is authentic, word will get out. There are armies of people scouring the internet, paid to scour the internet to find authentic items and recommend them. And uh, these collectors have wealth, and they will buy them. And that's all there is to it. All right. The other thing you want to do is take a look at the auction house that you're dealing with. Go to their website. Do they have any experts on staff? Mm, no. Um, do they even have the names of the people? Often, many of these auction houses don't even have a, a name of any staff members. Um, no one to call. They just have a general phone number and that kind of thing. All right. So that's it. All right. So then you have how do they present the stuff? How do they get away with it? All right. And uh, it's sort of how they set up the sales. And the first big thing that a lot of them do is that they may not do it with the entire auction, but what they will do, they will fake provenance, they will fake the names of collectors, they will, they will, they will Photoshop old photographs and do all kinds of things like that, all right? They'll pull out old photographs off the internet of people who are the alleged collector, for example, and um, they'll throw it in Photoshop, they'll turn it into a sepia, and they'll, they'll Put the you know put that in a, in, a, in, a, in the listing in the ad, and then they'll take a, a, an old photograph of a historic room or something. We've done a video on it, as a matter of fact. We we showed we showed some of the photos that they had actually used, thrown into Photoshop of, of you know these are historic buildings around the country and sometimes in the world, and they'll just pull that photograph offline, edit it, Photoshop in the objects that are in the auction into those pictures. And then say, oh, here it is. This, this is, this is, these are the, the vases when uh, back in 1928 when they were in this man's grandfather's collection. 
And people don't realize they can do that. They can do that and no one's going to stop them. And they're not worried about being gone after uh, for misrepresentation. And they do it all the time. They reproduce receipts. All right. They take they take they'll 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 find uh, some old um, advertisements from from Spinks or something, uh, reputable companies, and they will create a letterhead. They'll pour tea on it. They'll do all kinds of tricks to make it look old, and then they'll list the items on on that re on that receipt and say, "Oh, look, they bought this at Spinks in nineteen you know nineteen eighteen during World War One. Wow," and and that's it. And a good story goes a long way because people again don't believe that you can just make stuff up like that you just can't make people can't make that up i've had, I had somebody once tell me that and they said yeah they can and there's nothing anybody's going to do about it um often you'll have somebody who will say well this this was given to the man by a friend of his grandfather's who was a friend of uh one of the members you know uh, friends of uh, emperor Pu Yi or, or or some other you know high-ranking uh chinese of, uh, official at the end of the qing dynasty or something um and, and, and this was snuck out of China and was in California and it was left to this guy because, you know, uh, he, he had been such a good friend. Nonsense. All right. Nonsense. Um, uh, uh, one, one, one story I heard was that the, 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 often they use, they'll say, well, he served in the Navy. He was in the military and he served in Vietnam. And while he was in Vietnam, um, in the Navy, he, he was able to buy this incredible collection of Chinese art. Well, there's a lot wrong with that story. One, he's at a war. He's in Vietnam. There's not that much. There's very little imperial art in China. I mean, from China in Vietnam. And uh, l lastly, um, uh, how the heck is a GI going to be uh, storing away dozens and dozens of, of vases well, on a ship? <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it's, the, whole, the whole scenario is just preposterous. All right, but people will believe it because they because the people well he's serving his country. A man that served his country would have never allow his name to be used for something fraudulent and blah 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 blah, and that's the, sort of the end of it. Or you'll get the uh, consigner befriended a major collector and was given the items. That's an old one. It's an oldie but a goodie. Um, and sometimes people have pieces of old labels from you know Sotheby's, Christie's, Bonhams, Park Benet labels and all that. Well, yeah, they do turn up. They turn up. Sometimes you'll see those stickers will turn up at an auction somewhere, um, and the, the auction will get peeled off and stuck on something else. All right? Uh, you know, there's no shortage in the world of old Sotheby's, Christie's, and Bonhams labels, and occasionally Park Bonnet labels. All right? Park Bonnet was an auction house in New York that became part of Sotheby's. It was absorbed by Sotheby's and became finally just Sotheby's. But at any rate, those labels are around, and people can, people can get them, and they can put them on anything they want. All right? So that's something you, you have to keep, ignore most always the provenances that these places offer. Just ignore it. That doesn't mean anything. And then, then go in and look at how do auction houses handle inquiries about authenticity. All right. And what you should really need to look for. And, and the standard reply in most cases is, is for example, uh, uh, and they got to make it they well auction houses either act incredibly vague and don't really know and we're not experts or they go full bore with a big story uh, those are sort of the, it's either cold or hot there's there's no not much of an in between and uh, so, so always keep in mind that no consigner is likely to go to some podunk auction house when a major reputable auction house would be more than delighted to handle the, a transaction of an object um, um, you know, n neither would any serious, serious or experienced collector. If you have a person who's a serious collector that's built up a big collection, it, the first place he, he's going to call isn't some rinky-dink auction house with no history and, and a poor reputation because he, he's going to know that they sell fakes. So why the heck would he give his collect the family give the collection of them? Um, and, and that's sort of the, uh, the, the way it goes. And then you get other kinds of replies that make no sense. Uh, for example, um, they may just reply and say, the item is authentic uh, because our, according to our expert, it's authentic. And then you say, well, who's the expert? And they'll give you the name of somebody. And it's, it's often somebody that doesn't even exist. Or um, it's just somebody that works at the auction house that was, that was you, know, w w you know, working in the, at the Walmart six months ago before he went to work at the auction house. All right. <clears throat> the other great line is, um, we don't specialize in Asian art, but it came from a very old collection. That's one of the most common um, um, rebuttals or responses you get from auction houses. Or it came from a very private secret collection formed decades ago. All right. When you hear that, run for your life. 
all right? Um, or you may hear, according to the family, it was bought in China by a great grandfather a hundred years ago. And uh, they, they don't know anything more about it, okay? They just had this, they have these pieces. And uh, I had one guy, uh, uh, one auction house say, well, um, we're old friends of the consigner and they felt uncomfortable dealing with a big auction house. Right, okay, <laughs> silliness, silliness. Uh, okay, and often uh, the, the consigners are the children of the collector who lived in pick, pick a place, England, Taiwan, Japan, Los, whatever, Los Angeles. And uh, um, they wanted to deal with a local business uh, because they were, they were more comfortable and they offered better terms. And, and sometimes they'll even say, well, Sotheby's was begging for the collection, but they were, they were, their, their rates were too high, which is absolute nonsense. Um, and then, and then the, the other thing is that they'll say, well, the family realized that we, we use the internet just like all the other big auction houses. We're charging less and we get the same audience as uh, Christie's does. So they're, they're gonna do it here locally, plus we can sell it sooner. Um, another one is, well, they were going to sell it in Hong Kong, but they couldn't wait as they had to settle the estate. Um, so they blame the government on it, uh, or they need money for tuition or something else. The, the fact of the matter is, is if somebody had a major collection and they had a financial shortfall or some reason that they needed a bit of money to settle the estate, if you give, if you, if you've got to give Sotheby's or Christie's or, or any of them or, or Freeman's or whatever, and, and you're going to give them a consignment that's potentially worth millions and millions of dollars, and you say, well, look, you know, um, we'll sign the contract with you. You're absolutely going to sell it, get all that cleared up. But we, we need an advance on the proceeds of three or four hundred thousand um, dollars. They're going to get it. They're going to get it. The, the auction houses are perfectly fine with doing that. Um, it's not a problem. OK, so those are the things you really want to look out to. And then people will think, well, what about the government? OK, if they sell fakes, why aren't the authorities taking action? Um, aren't they licensed by the state? Wouldn't they be shut down if they were dishonest? These are the kind of things you hear. And the truth is that no, most states do very little enforcement when it comes to um, uh, fraudulent auctioneers that take, or the licenses or fraudulent description violations. They simply don't care. All right. And unless the auctioneer uh, doesn't send the goods after it's been paid for, they're not going to do anything. They, they, they'll get involved if you buy something, you know, you're in California, you buy something in, in North Carolina or someplace and you don't get the item, um, then you can get the state auctioneer commission involved. But not all states have auction licenses, too. Important to know. All right. New York State doesn't have an auctioneer license requirement. New York City does, but the state doesn't. So if you're selling an upstate, and it doesn't mean you're dishonest either. I don't want to give the inference that if you're in a state that doesn't require auction licenses, that the person is by default dishonest. That's not true. But it, if you are dishonest, it gives you an awful lot of wiggle room. All right. And generally, the auction houses, or like I said before, if the auctions are all online, most auction licensing authorities have absolutely no authority. They have no regulatory authority over the online seller. They, they, there's nothing they can do, and they'll tell you that. In live sales with online bidding, licenses can be, can be uh, 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 you know, gone after a bit, but it has to be something awfully blatant, okay? And um, that's all there is to it. So caveat emptor. As far as your credit card goes, this is the, the, well, the other thing that people often say is, well, I put it on my credit card, so I'm protected. I put it on my Visa or my MasterCard or my Amex card. I'm protected from fraud. Um, you know, that's what it is. And, um, and if, if, you, if you pay for the item and you don't get it, yeah, they can help you then. But if the item is a fake and was blatantly misrepresented, um, the auction house, all they have to do is show the uh, credit card company their terms of service with their disclaimers on it. And 99% of the time, the credit card company isn't going to do anything. They're not going to help you because you have to realize the credit card company is making their money off of the seller, not off of you, the buyer. All right. Uh, they like you as a user, but their revenue, they realize w which side of the bread is you know being buttered here. It's the seller, they, the, the seller. Is, is who they want to keep happy. They, but you know, the, the, the auction house that's putting through millions of dollars a year in charges, they want that business because they're getting two and a half percent of it or 2.9 percent of it or 2.2 percent of it. They're getting a chunk of the trade. So it adds up to a significant amount of money. They're no different than Bloomingdale's. All right. Visa is very good to Bloomingdale's because they want Bloomingdale's to keep taking Visa. The auction houses are the same to a smaller level, but still it's, it's a, a, a financial motivation and there's nothing they can, anybody can do about it. All right. And, and that's really the, the gist of it. So the bottom line is, is that the auction houses 
um, rely on inexperienced people. And that is why, as I said, you never see the prices really climbing up. And after repeated auctions of, of, of supposed rare items, the prices never go up because the, the auction houses know that experienced buyers aren't going to come near them. They're not going to come near them. Beginners are going to go to them. All right. If you want to, you know, if you if you if you want to buy good stuff, yeah, go to the big auction house. You can do business with them. You know, you can go to Freeman's. From, uh, the folks at Freeman's will be more happy to talk with you, or or Rick over at Doyle's, or or Mike Bass at Christie's. All these people, Sotheby's, Bonhams, uh, Colin Sheaf, all these, they're, they're they're there to do business with you. They want to talk to you. All right. And if you're interested in bidding in one of their online sales, you will find them to be remarkably responsive, responsive to your inquiries. Uh, they'll, they'll get you more pictures. They'll, they, they want your business. All right. And um, that's where you should be. <clears throat> For some reason, there's a reluctance, I think, among some people to go to major auction houses. I don't know why, uh, but you shouldn't. Uh, that They want you to register with them. They want you to bid with them and they want you to buy from them. And um, that's really it. Um, and you can do it with a much higher level of confidence and comfort range than you can by buying from some, um, um, you know, a, a, a nobody auction house in, in, in uh, the Midwest that's uh, full of uh, what appear to be the, the, the greatest ceramics on earth outside of the Palace Museum collection. So keep all that in mind, okay? I hope this was useful. If I went too quickly, I apologize. Go back and listen to it again. Uh, but there are a lot of points to go through uh, to, to learn how to spot fake auctions, how to spot fake objects, and think about how you think, how you're viewing this, and, and, and give yourself constantly reality checks about what's real and what's not, and what's likely to be real, and what's most likely not. Okay, and eventually you'll get there. Ask questions and keep in mind that once you buy it and once you pay for it, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, um, in, in virtually all the cases that I've ever seen, I've never seen anybody get their money back from anybody uh, for selling a fake, um, and that's all there is to it. All right, other than the big auction, if you get something in a big auction house with a mistake or something went wrong in the cataloging and it's misdescribed, uh, they'll fix it for you, but the other places won't. Okay. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here on YouTube if you like the videos. And um, uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow with a weekly video. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Give us a thumbs up and leave a, co leave a comment on this, by the way. Love to hear what you have to say. Okay. Bye-bye.